Hello and welcome to another episode of On the Road to Excellence. I'm Jameer Howerton and I have the honor to be joined by Gold Jacket James Lofton. And uh, Mr. Lofton, we just got done with another yes. U.S. Army Pro Football Hall of Fame Award for Excellence here in Stur Stur I gotta get it right. Sturgeon Bay. Sturgeon Bay, because I like, like the fish. Like the fish. Sturgeon Bay, where we celebrate the excellence of Nathan Leroy. Correct. Now, it, it's always interesting when you come to smaller communities, and you and I, before we went there, we we're trying to guess what, what what's the size of the graduating class. We looked, the town has about 10,000 people in it. Right. Graduating class of 91 students. You know, here's a kid who is offensive and defensive lineman, all league. He's a national and a state recognized power lifter, track and field. His dad is the coach of the football team and the track teams. So there, there's a lot of expectation for him. There's a four point plus student. Plus That's student. what I say, because he was so uh, conscientious about not wanting to rub it into anybody's face that he was more than 4.0, but he is more than 4.0. He is more than 4.0, and you can see all of this content on www.profootballhof.com. Mr. Lofton, you delivered a very impactful speech today, but you really paid homage to the young kid. This program is near and dear to your heart. It, it is. Both my parents were in the military. My mom was a whack and that was the Women's Army Corps, and that was a long time ago. That was right around World War II. And my dad was in for 22 years. He rose to the rank of E9. Wow. Because he wasn't a college graduate, that was as high as he could go. Couldn't have African Americans go any higher. They couldn't become uh, more than just enlisted men. So he was a sergeant major, and uh, you know, I really credit my dad because he ended up raising the kids after my parents got divorced. But I credit him with a, a lot of my thinking and a lot of it, I look at things that the military stresses about teamwork, about integrity, about finishing what you start. Those are things that he preached over and over to me. This is the sixth year of this program and you've been a part of this since 2004. You actually keep in touch with certain sure. finalists. Talk about well, that. I've had five kids mm. and it's almost like I have five new nieces and nephews so at Christmas I make sure that I'm in touch with them a little note uh, when they graduated obviously getting in touch with them so it, it's really important my oldest kid in the program next year will be a senior in college Wow! and so to, to watch somebody and to, to be aware of them all the way through he's at the University of Wisconsin and so he'll be finishing up next year and probably on to graduate school and bigger and better things after that. Well, when we talk about on the road to excellence, I would be remiss if I didn't say happy anniversary to you <laughs> because 40 years ago to the date to of the day. May 7th, 19 May 2nd. May 2nd, excuse yeah. me, 1978. I was eight years old by then. You know, At least at you were time. born. <laughs> See, that, that's the thing. All of a sudden, and you, you go through this, as you get older and you have these things that are benchmarks, you did something at such and such, and you, you hear somebody go, oh, I wasn't even born then. <laughs> so you, you don't want to hear that. And right. I made sure that when I mentioned that I had been drafted 40 years ago to the day by the Green Bay Packers, I looked at Nathan and I said, Nathan, I know you weren't born then. <laughs> so I, I didn't want to ask his parents if they had been born, but right. I think they were a little older than 40. But yeah, 40 years ago, it was Green Bay Packers. Ago, 40 years ago. And today we got a chance before we went to the ceremony to visit your home. And that, what, what did it feel like? You know, when, when I go back and I think about that house and I think about the reason why I bought that house. I bought that house when I was at minicamp uh -huh. in May. And I bought it because I had proposed to my wife, Beverly. Wow. And so that was kind of like our first house in and, and a way that of saying, you know, yeah, you, you're just not my girlfriend, not just a fiance. You're somebody that I want to spend the rest of my life with. You know, right. I, I wasn't probably thinking that at the time. I'm just thinking, I need to buy a house. And I went up there, I bought a house and think about it. A guy goes into town, buys a house that his wife doesn't even get to look right, at. Right, right. That's kind of a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> and how cool was it? You got a chance to see Mr. and Mrs. Appleton, who My were next still door the next door neighbors, yeah. who were still there. That was so surprised to see you. Yeah, Dottie and Jim, just wonderful people, and they have four kids. Mm -hmm. And it was funny when we first moved in. Therefore, our kids seemed so much younger than what we were. And I think I was 25 or 20, and Beverly was 25. And their kids were, the oldest was 19. Wow. Now that gap is different. Right. A six-year gap, when you get 
60 plus, that's not a big gap at all. Right. And right. their youngest son, little Jason, is now over 50. Wow. So, wow. yeah. When you look back at the 40 years and you come back to Green Bay, just what are some of the things that you just kind of look around and go, man, this place has really changed. And, you know, just, 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 just taking that trip down memory lane. Lambeau Field is a constant. The Bay, the Fox River, those geographical things. Now, Lambeau Field has grown from 54,000 to 80,000. Right. The stadium is state of the art. You can have everything that you want there. And, and the community's changed. Mm. There were 75,000 people in wow. the Green Bay area, and now close to 300,000. So totally different, I think, a different experience for the players who are playing there now. Uh, it, not that Green Bay wasn't the big leagues, because this was title town. Right. But when we were playing, we weren't a championship caliber team. We made it to the playoffs one year of the nine years that I was there. We were competitive a lot. But the team has been so good in this Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers era, that when players come to Green Bay, they are excited about coming to Green right. Bay. They're not, they're, they're not going, oh, I got to go somewhere where it's cold. Gotcha. They're going somewhere where they have a chance to win and a chance to play for championships. You're speaking of championships, and I got to go back to this, to your 40th year year anniversary but when you got that phone call 40 years ago you told this, the group today that Bart Starr called you. Bart Starr was the head coach he was kind of the the general manager at the time but Carol Edwin was was his secretary and secretary right. for the Packers and it goes even further that because Carol and I ended up becoming good friends and you know she's around the organization every day and she would answer the phone Hello, the Green Bay Packers. And I said, Carol, you need to go Green Bay Packers. Carol speaking. Right. And she started doing that. Wow. And so she did it until she retired. The next woman who took over as a receptionist, Linda, started picking that up. And wow. so that was something that I suggested. And it just because it's such a personable, family-oriented mm -hmm. organization that when you call on the phone, now you call and, you know, you got to go through prompts <laughs> and all that. But when you had Carol and then Linda afterwards call and tell you, and Carol would say, Green Bay Packers, Carol's speaking, have a pleasant day. Wow. And you just felt good about calling in and saying, Man, let me talk to Coach Lou, my coach, or let me talk to Damo over in the in the training room. So it was very people-oriented, and I think it's still the same way now. Shabir Howerton joined by Gold Jack and James Lofton. We're on the road to excellence. We're driving as we continue our conversation. I just want to check in with you. What's been going on? I know what's been going on. Fans, you know what's been going on because last year you got a chance to see Gold Jack and James Lofton on air. That's right, talking football, talking shop, NFL. What's that been like? It has been... This was my past, you mentioned 40 years ago I was drafted. Mm -hmm. Well, I've spent 40 years in the NFL. Wow. As a player, then as a broadcaster, then coaching, coaching. and now back to the broadcast booth. And it, it was really interesting when, when I played for 16 years, mm -hmm. I felt like I knew a lot about football. Right. Then when I got to coach, I realized I know about this much about football. And as a player, you get I think like a high school equivalency degree. Right. When you go into coaching, you work on your undergraduate degree, your graduate degree, and then hopefully a PhD or whatever. And there's so much more to it than what meets the eye when you're just being a player. So being able to pass that along and pass along experiences, of being in the draft room, being in, in planning meetings when you're trying to plan the game plan, doing all those things as a coach then trying to relay that to viewers as you're as you're doing a broadcast. Right. Sometimes when I see a, a goofy trick play, yes, I call that an after midnight play. <laughs> and they go, "What? What do you mean?" Well, that play was devised after midnight when the coaches should have been at home sleeping. Wow. But they're in that office grinding like they talk about doing all yeah. the time, and they come up with a play that makes no sense at all. That's really cool because, like you said, you're giving us a perspective a from a former player. Be from a former coach sure. and just a fan of the game. And, and you know what? Even more so than that, as a parent. Mm. Because so many people who watch, their kids have played yes. youth football, high school football, some of them even college football. So they know football. They've been right. sitting in the stands a long time. Right. And you kind of forget that these players who are playing, their parents, their family watches the games. And that's one thing that I'm always very cognizant of when I'm doing a broadcast is that this player's parents or family members are listening because on every wow. play 
You have somebody who excels right. and somebody who, who gets beaten on the play. Right. You don't have to beat the guy up who had just gotten beaten on the play. Absolutely. Go ahead and, and, and highlight the excellence of the play. Sure, you know, if somebody misses coverage or misses a tackle, you can mention that, but you don't need to harp on it. Right. When I, you, um, actually, Northeast Ohio, I know you've heard Mr. Lofton this past season because you, like, you covered Browns games from I, top I, I to had some, bottom. I had about four Browns games last year. Okay. Uh, Hugh Jackson, you know, every week he'd come in believing this was the week they were going to win. Wow. Because you, wh why else would you be in this business? Right. You know, you, right. you talk to guys who play the game, and there's a certain level of respect that you're trying to get from your opponent. Mm -hmm. And the only way you get that respect is by competing. Right. You know, some people might say, well, they didn't win a game, they, they were bums. But how did they compete? And I can say, as I watched the Browns play, they might have been outmanned, but they never gave up. They always right. competed as hard as they could every week, weekend wow. and week out. And you got a chance to work with um, your your play-by-play, -play, Andrew Cataline really nice man. I got a chance to work with him when I was a sideline reporter for the Browns, and he's very thorough, well-read, well-read individual. The passion that just keeps you around the game. Talk about that. Well, I heard somebody say once, if you can't do it, coach it. If you can't coach it, talk about it. <laughs> so that's kind of where I am. But I, I just, I love the game. You love the players who are in the game. Um, when we when we have a game, we, we go to a city that is hosting the game, and on Friday we go to that home team's practice. Right. So we're in their building, we eat their lunch, then we interview the head coach, maybe the offensive and defensive coordinators, and then a handful of players. Right. Normally the quarterback, uh, outstanding linemen, either offensively or defensively, somebody who's going to handle the ball, uh, running back or wide receiver, and then maybe a defensive back or a linebacker. And so we kind of get a feel for what they're thinking and how they're going to approach the game. And then the next Saturday, the next day, uh -huh. the visiting team comes into town. Gotcha. We meet with the same kind of assortment of players. So you're not trying to pull for either team, right? but you're pulling for both of them. You're pulling for an excellent game, a competitive game, and you try not to go into the game with a preconceived notion as to who's going to win. Gotcha. Now, I know you talk shop and you got to talk football, but do you ever find a certain player will come to you and go, wow, man, like I grew up watching you or my dad told me all about you? I get that more from the coaches. Okay. And and not only that, I get from some of the coaches who are have been in the business for a while, they might have coached against me when I was playing. Wow. And there are some guys that I coached against and there are still guys that I coach with okay. who are out there in, in the coaching ring. So you get those connections. Uh, you get connections on, on different players. And, and now, as you look around the National Football League and you look at the drafts, there are a lot of sons of players who are getting drafted. So I played with your dad or my dad played against you or you know something yeah. like that. So it, it's all linked together. You, yeah. you remember that six degrees of separation? Absolutely. I can start with me and I can get all the way back to Jim Thorpe within, five, within six players. Wow. So that's, that's the whole gamut of professional football right there. Wow, wow. Well, we're headed towards Green Bay, Wisconsin. We're gonna catch this Title flight. Town. Title Town, <laughs> yes, Title Town. Uh, we had some good food last night. We did, we That's did, we, we ate at a nice steak restaurant. Yes. Um, I don't know if there's, I know there's all these fancy type of beefs. Right. But Midwestern beef, Right. hard to beat. And, and guys, I learned that if you like your steak medium, but you don't want to have it bloody, but you don't want it medium well, you order it medium plus. Medium plus. Now, you guys probably know that. I didn't know that, but I learned that yesterday from this man here. So that's my new way of ordering a steak medium plus. Medium and, plus. And the other thing that you did which was amazing. You made it all, all disappear in like two minutes. <laughs> The fat skinny boy has to eat, Mr. Lofton. That's, that's one thing I do. I like to talk. I like to have fun, but I love to eat. I love to eat. Just, um, I know you, you, you talked about how much things have changed around here in Green Bay, um, but I need to talk to you about their pro, their, their Hall of Fame. Sure. Magnificent. They did a fabulous job with that. Because it's also encased within the stadium, mm -hmm. it's it's all there. the The Green Bay Packers 
did a fantastic job in kind of renovating the stadium. I, you know, a lot of people love these these home improvement shows that you watch, and right. you know, somebody will go in and they'll remodel, and then they come back and they have to decide: are they going to love this house, or are they going to move to another house? You look at what they did in Lambeau Field and how they kept the history, the tradition there, but they also made it a state-of-the-art destination mm. 365 days out of the year where there's a restaurant there's a shop there's the, the green bay packer hall of fame and the artifacts that they have in that rival what you can get in canton right and and i also think that it's the most visited hall of fame because obviously you have you know game days during the season where you're going to have twenty thousand people are going to flow through there absolutely and so people are always coming constantly it is um Next to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, it's certainly a destination, and I think it's the top stadium destination in the NFL. If you had one place you could go to one game, you want to go to Lambeau Field because it feels like the birth of pro football. Wow, wow. Speaking of the birth of pro football, when I look at the Chicago Bears and I look at the Green Bay Packers, uh, two historic franchise quite the rivalry yeah quite the rivalry and, and still rivaling I, I don't quote me on the number but i know chicago holds more hall of famers than green bay but not by that much but you have a hall of famer going in this year yes jerry kramer how excited for you for kramer to be inducted in well it, it's kind of the, the the last knot on that lombardi era team okay um it was interesting because you got to remember there was a merger yeah. in the, with the National Football League and the American Football League. Yes. And there was a time when everybody said, well, we got enough NFL guys in. And so all of a sudden, somebody who's as great as Jerry Kramer was, it's kind of pushed to the side and says, well, we got to kind of balance this out a little bit. And in that room, those reporters who were AFL guys were kind of pushing for their guys. Gotcha. Which, which kind of makes sense because they saw these guys play up close and personal. And the NFL guys are saying, well, you know, we got all these other guys and, yeah, you know, let's let a couple of AFL guys in. So you look at these uh, guys who get in after their, you know, you know, time is up and they, they go get on the senior ballot. Jerry Kramer is 83 years old. He didn't become a better player since he was 53 or 63 or 73, but it's his chance now. And the graciousness with which he's going in, never did you, have I heard him say, oh, I should have been in 10 years ago. Right. He's thankful and grateful for getting to go in now. And, and I think a lot of players are. Even the, even the young player who gets bypassed three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, right. Right. when they finally get the call to go in, it's a humbling experience because you realize out of everybody who's played the game, 300 and some odd Hall of Famers, and not all of those are players. Right. Some administrators, some coaches, some other people. So the number of players, under 300. Right, right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you had to go with an opportunity of actually being in that room. And I know there's right. certain things that you can and cannot say due to proper protocol, but how intense is it? I, I'm a selector, and so when I travel around and I'm doing, say, a game in Oakland, mm -hmm. people will come up to me and say, well, why isn't Cliff Branch in the Hall of Fame? Why isn't Tom Flores in the Hall of Fame? Why isn't so-and-so in the Hall of Fame? You're in a, another part of the country. Why isn't this player in the Hall of Fame? And I can tell you that after we have the selection done at the Super Bowl, the, 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 a couple of days before the Super Bowl game, Two weeks later, we get a list with 130 players. You're gonna look at those 130 players. They were guys who made all pro, pro bowls and all this. We've got to then whittle that 130 down to 25. Wow. And then subsequently, we go from 25 down to 15. Wow. And remember, we're only gonna select five or six from that initial list of 130. Okay. So it is the best of the best. And this past year, we had 15 candidates that we looked at, and you could you could make a great case for all 15 of them. Now we put in five, so that means there are 10 more to go back into Tumblr right. to start over. And then you have guys who are going to be quote first ballot Hall of Famers that kind of move to the front of the class. Mm. So it, it's a it's an arduous process, but to be one of the 15 finalists, and now those players are brought 
to the Super Bowl so that they can go to banquets, that they can be celebrated during the course of the week as they wait on pins and needles yeah. to find out if they're going to be elected up yeah. for a selection to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Wow. And this year you have two receivers going in, Randy Moss, who's right. the first ballot. Randy Moss. But Terrell, Terrell Owens. Terrell Owens. And, and I don't get so hung up on first ballot. Right. Um, because... I don't think anywhere under your bus does it say first ballot. No. It has your name. Name and yeah, yeah exactly. and that, that's it. So yeah, it's it, there's, it's kind of nice to be first ballot, but but the timing just has to be right. And sometimes you can get in on first ballot like two receivers that never gone in together before. Right. But they were two guys who were who were very accomplished, and you know, like Chris Carter said, now the history of pro football is written with them. But I say this, the history of pro football is written by everybody who ever stepped on the field. Mm. Not just the Hall of Famers, not just the All Pros, not just the Pro Bowlers, but everyone who's ever played this game. And everyone who has ever played this game is acknowledged at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton. And that's where you need to be in August, August 4th. Um, starting off, we got a great weekend ahead. We have uh, the Chicago Bears versus the Baltimore Ravens. Then you're going to have, um, and, oh my God. And, and two linebackers going in the Yeah, oh, I'm time. sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to pull up. <laughs> yes, two linebackers. You, you, it, it, it's, it's interesting. All the things that are kind of no-nos, or you can't have two linemen going. You mm -hmm. can't have two linebackers. You couldn't have two quarterbacks going. Yes, you can. Right. What we're commissioned to do is to put in the best of those because we do a reduction what what happens we go from 15 okay down to 10 and then we go to 10 down to five and then when we get to five we vote and if they get 80 percent of the votes then they then they then they move in but that reduction from 25 down to 15 and then you discuss those 15 what you call in the room and then you take it then you just take all 15 and you just put a check next to the next 10 that you want to move on. Gotcha. And sometimes you get 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10 of the guys that you thought would move on. Sometimes there are a couple guys, when you get that 10 back, you go, well, what happened to so-and-so? I thought he that was the guy I voted for. Right. Everybody else didn't vote for him. Right. So there are differences of opinions, and uh, it's, it's a great process, a very well thought-out process that just on that one day alone takes about 10 hours. 10 hours? 10 hours. Well, that was a great conversation. That concludes our On the Road to Excellence. For Gold Jacket, James Lofton, I'm Jameer Howerton. We'll see you next time on the road.